Live from KSAT 12, the 6 o'clock news starts right now. A restaurant on the northeast side struggling like many to keep its doors open during the coronavirus pandemic, having to deal with another more aggressive problem. Thieves taking the entire inventory. The owners of 225 Urban Smoke on Ritterman targeted by burglars overnight. They posted on the restaurant Facebook page that they wouldn't be opening today because crooks clean clean them out overnight. Thousands of dollars worth of food in the walk in coolers was taken. Briskets, ribs, chicken, turkey, catfish, like our, our whole entire inventory and we were stocking up for the weekend because, you know, people going to be moving around more. That truck delivering the inventory delivered a couple of days ago. The owner says it is all gone today between 13 and $15,000 worth gone. The hope surveillance video will help police catch the crooks. We're told 225 urban smoke will be open for business tomorrow. At least one person in the Bear County criminal court system has tested positive for the coronavirus, with another awaiting test results and a third in quarantine. Paul Venema with a look at the cases and efforts to keep the numbers in the system down. A part time magistrate judge here has tested positive for the coronavirus and a court reporter who works at the courthouse is awaiting test results. At this point, they're both being isolated and we're making sure that everybody they have contact with um, is safe. That includes a prosecutor who is now in quarantine. Metropolitan Health District personnel are conducting contact tracing for anyone who may have had contact with the individuals. As we have a very minimal amount of folks working at the courthouse, um, we don't anticipate that it was a lot of folks that they had contact with. Empty hallways and mandatory face masks within the courthouse complex are among the reasons why the numbers are relatively low, according to Rod Hell. He said that despite the now, governor's reopening plan set, set to new, go into effect tomorrow. A course that responsibly opens up business in Texas. Things here will remain the same. That means the only business in the courts will be conducted remotely. I'm following minimally the Office of Court Administration guidelines, which come out from the Court of Criminal Appeals and the Texas Supreme Court. And those have indicated that we should not have in-person hearings until June the 1st. That's the target date for lifting the moratorium on jury service. Paul Venema, KSAT 12 News. Texas will begin to reopen tomorrow as some businesses like restaurants and theaters can operate in a limited capacity. But local officials are still keeping an eye on the health situation. A locally assembled team is recommended following certain indicators like a declining number of cases and the rate at which the number of overall cases double to decide whether to clamp down or loosen up restrictions. The governor, though, is already moving on his own timeline to reopen the state and his orders trump any contradicting local ones. Mayor Ron Nuremberg, though, noted things can change quickly. So we have to really assess where we are at the time they need to transition, but we're going to be mindful of the health data and we're going to follow it as closely as we are able to uh, with the authority that we have. The mayor and county judge both issued new orders last night, which aligned with the governor's plans in regard to partially reopening some businesses, though the order also included a mask or face covering requirement. There won't be any penalty for not wearing one. Well, encouraging news in the fight against COVID-19 that included clinical trials in San Antonio. Preliminary national results show an experimental antiviral drug seems to be effective in treating seriously ill patients. Early results indicate remdesivir improves recovery times by more than 30% compared to a placebo from 15 days to 11. It also lowers the mortality rate to 8%, yet it was more than 11% with a placebo. Does your heart good to uh, really see potential advances and see patients do better? We've had a number of patients that have really improved. But Patterson says more data about remdesivir is yet to come. It is not FDA approved yet. He says the clinical trials here and elsewhere in the U.S. are part of an international effort to test its safety and effectiveness. 
Most of the voters surveyed in our Bearfax KSAT Rivard Report poll feel the closure of local businesses is a serious problem. As we know, closing businesses is a measure not only taken by our state, but throughout the country and the entire world due to COVID-19. Devin Clark explains how a local Eastside nonprofit is working through the pandemic to help cushion the blow for small businesses in that area. We've had to pivot just like every other business uh, in the world and in the country. 77% of Bearfax KSAT Rivard report poll respondents see the closure of local businesses as an extremely or very serious problem. San Antonio for Growth on the East Side, or SAGE, a nonprofit dedicated to helping invigorate that part of town, is trying to make sure that small businesses in that area weather the storm. We have a database that's full of our businesses on the East Side, and we are physically calling each one of them to find out how they've been impacted, what their updated hours and services are, if they're even open at that point. Sage CEO Tuesday night understands the alarming statistics. 23% of Bearfax KSAT Rivard report poll respondents are worried that the coronavirus will result in loss of jobs or income for their household. 65% say that low wages are an extremely or very serious problem in San Antonio. It's reasons why Knight says that Sage is helping Eastside small business owners apply for emergency funding and making sure that they understand how to access available resources. In these calls, we have found that they're really struggling. They're struggling financially. They're struggling um, to keep their doors open. They're struggling with all these new guidelines that are coming out. We have more local data regarding the economic impact of COVID-19 on our website, KSAT.com, as well as information on how to contact SAGE for help. Reporting on the east side, Devin Clark, KSAT 12 News. Our Bearfax KSAT Rivard Report poll also revealed that 59% of respondents are worried that someone in their household will be infected with COVID-19. And that's just one of the unique stressors our frontline medical workers must deal with every day. Ursula Perry explains how the pressure on medical workers is so intense that UT Health has expanded a program to help them to keep up with their emotional health. News that a healthy ER doctor in New York on the front lines of treating COVID-19 patients committed suicide this week is so disturbing. But it's also confirmation that the stress of being a medical worker right now cannot be ignored. Um, you know, I've heard a lot of the cases where um, physician mothers are worried about bringing this home to their babies. Dr. Eliza Moldonado was part of the UT Health Wellness Team. It's among the many reasons an anonymous online mental health screening tool for medical workers is now in reach for more people on the front lines. Recently, we have extended this service to faculty members as well. So they will have access now to this um, anonymous online self-screener and also to um, our counseling services um, through the ISP platform. The fears of medical personnel who are experiencing emotional issues from a variety of factors, including feeling overwhelmed or in some cases being sidelined from the healing because they were furloughed, is complicated. I, I have seen a lot of people struggling with that lately as um, you know, they're kind of bracing themselves for something that has not yet happened. Of course, the greatest stressor of all for health workers is the severity of the virus and the number of deaths. If you are not within the UT health system and you can't take advantage of this wellness program, but you're feeling emotionally fragile, there are lots of other places to go for help. Just look for this story on our website, ksat.com. Ursula Perry, KSAT 12 News. Time saver traffic right now. This is 281 at St. Mary's. I think we're looking northbound here. Not a lot of traffic out there, and that's a good thing. But a beautiful day. Oh, it's gorgeous outside. Yeah, let's go ahead and take a live look. Speaking of which, 88 degrees out there feeling nice, Adam. Yeah, low humidity outside, and if you love the humidity, well, your time will come as soon as this weekend. Now, the aquifer took another hit today down half a foot and we're nearly a foot below the April average. And with this kind of weather pattern that's going on, we're not looking at really any boost in that aquifer level. We've got the big blue H that's settling overhead. It's going to camp out for several days. The big bump in the upper level flow, upper level high, that's going to give us the dry conditions. As for temperatures, this morning we were in the 50s, even some 40s in the hill country, but now well into the 80s. 
Even 91 in Castroville, 88 Pleasanton, 87 at Randolph. And as we go through the evening, we'll see those temperatures fall through the 70s, 60s, and by tomorrow morning, I anticipate more 50s across South Texas. So another unseasonably cool start to the day tomorrow. We'll talk about the return of the heat and humidity and just how hot it's going to get coming right up. High risk and some say overlooked. Tonight, why members of the LGBT community say they remain one of the most vulnerable groups during the coronavirus pandemic and what they're now asking of city leaders. COVID-19 interrupts plans for couples wishing to start a family. A woman going through IVF shares her story. Contact tracing. It's a process that's helped slow or stop previous epidemics like Ebola and SARS. Courtney Friedman on how it's being used to combat the coronavirus. Contact tracing tracks down anyone who might have been infected by a person who was recently diagnosed with COVID-19, so those contacts can quarantine themselves and prevent further spread. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention say public health staff work with a patient to help them recall everyone whom they have had close contact with during the time frame where they may have been infectious. Then contacts are provided with education, information, and support to understand their risk, what they should do to separate themselves from others and monitor themselves for symptoms and the possibility that they could spread the infection to others even if they don't feel ill. Researchers say the U.S. cannot safely reopen without significant amounts of contact tracing and testing. Contact tracers use a variety of methods, including phone calls, emails, and social media messaging. A recent study released by Johns Hopkins University estimates the U.S. needs at least 100,000 additional public health workers to help with contact tracing before it's safe to reopen. Courtney Friedman, KSAT 12 News. Go ahead and listen into the daily briefing by the mayor and the county judge. 46.4% uh, of our cases are now recovered uh, from this virus, and that leaves 689 people in our count of those who are fighting the virus currently. Tonight, we have two additional deaths to report, which brings us to a total of 40, 48 deaths associated with coronavirus in our community. We have details on one of them that I'll re I reported to you yesterday. That person was a white female in her 80s, and then the one that uh, additional that we are confirming today uh, is a the death of an Amer African American male in his 30s. Uh, our condolences to the loved ones of those who we've lost. Uh, today at the City Council, we did, uh, the City Council voted to extend the stay home, work safe or order uh, that was revised by the judge and, and I yesterday. Uh, that is extended now to May 19th. And right now, I'd like to turn it over to Judge Wolf. Uh, thank, thank you, Mayor. Uh, we're sad to report today uh, with all our county employees who are mourning the death of T Timothy De La Fuente. Uh, he was a 27-year veteran of the detention center and a deputy. He passed away at the young age of 53 years old. Uh, he had just taken the uh, test for COVID on the, on the 29th, this just past Tuesday. Uh, we were expecting to notify him of the results of that test today, which were a positive test. Uh, but he uh, went home. Uh, this morning he had called uh, in to say that he was complaining of uh, pains and a dry cough. His wife was getting ready to take him to the emergency center, but he went in the restroom and he passed away at home. Uh, it's a tragedy and, and one that... Um, clearly shows that all of us are vulnerable, regardless of our age and, and regardless of what's happening with, with, with our lives. Uh, we're continuing to get a big rise at the uh, COVID-related in the jail. Uh, we began uh, a few days ago testing as many as we can in the inmates that had been in close uh, proximity to others that, that, had it with, that had symptoms. These were asymptomatic inmates that we tested. There's still a lot not known about how they um, pass it on and, and, and how that happens. Uh, but we've jumped now from uh, some 65 more uh, total uh, uh, inmates in the last two days that are positive to a total of about 129, uh, taking away the ones that have uh, 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 come back and, re and returned and, 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 and were cured. We're down to about 104 inmates in the uh, in the jail today. So we're separating those that were asymptomatic, positive in units, and separating them also those that were uh, symptomatic and, and and had the had the COVID also. 
as well as separating ones that come in. So it's been a real challenge in the jail today, and one we knew we had a problem on, and now we see it uh, beginning to escalate, at, it, regardless of all the things that we've done to try uh, to, to, to contain it. Uh, tomorrow, uh, May 5th, starting at 10 o'clock, uh, we'll be taking applications for uh, uh, assistance uh, for rent for those people that live in the 26 other uh, suburban cities as well as the unincorporated areas of the, uh, of the county. Uh, you can contact our offices at 210-940-1180 and we'll get your application in and, uh, and we will process it and, and, and see if we can be of help. Uh, we are going to open up Bibliotech uh, this coming Monday uh, at 9 a.m. in the morning. And the reason we made that decision to open is because we are in neighborhoods that do not have access to, um, to the Internet. Uh, the vast majority of people in, those, in the east side, west side, south side do not have that access. So we're going to start opening just Monday through Friday, limited hours from 9 o'clock to 5 p.m., holding the 25% occupancy. But we're going to be able to have people come in, uh, be able to give them a, a ebook reader, an iPad to take home, uh, give them a Wi-Fi connection to take home, uh, provide free printing for them, copying, scanning, and faxing, and the use of our computers uh, within, our, uh, within, our, within our library. So uh, we think that's an important thing to be able to do to uh, get it going and help people in these areas. Thank you, Judge. And you did see it on your screen earlier, but something worth highlighting uh, is the fact that our hospital numbers continue to be uh, in strong shape, and that's an important part of flattening the curve and making sure that we're well prepared for any scenario in COVID-19. Something that you don't see on the screen, though, that is an encouraging sign is we do track the transports related to COVID-19 calls, and that has been declining over the last several days. So uh, we, we look forward again to looking through this data and making sure that we're continue to stay on track with social distancing and ensuring that we're containing this virus the best we can with the practices that we undertake. To that note, I do want to say a very special thank you to the vast and diverse faith community here in San Antonio. There has been uh, orders issued from the state as well as the local governments, but everyone has been extremely proactive in the faith community. The churches uh, all over the city have been doing a very good job with the advisements they've been giving to their congregations and the practicing of social distancing, but most importantly, the online services that are being conducted uh, every Sunday and even throughout the week. So we want to say thank you for that. Keep up the great work. You are helping us uh, save the lives of this community, and it's greatly appreciated. Uh, as always, you can get the latest on COVID-19 in our community by going to covid19.sanantonio.gov, or you can text COSAGOV to 55000. Before we go to questions now, I'd like to turn it over to Assistant City Manager Dr. Colleen Bridger, who will go over the highlights of our health transition team. All right, there you hear the latest from the county judge and Mayor Ron Nuremberg. Uh, 1,374 positive cases in Bear County. That's up 48 from yesterday uh, and 48 deaths reported. That includes uh, a woman from yesterday and the latest, the deputy Timothy De La Fuente, who is a Bear County Sheriff's Office deputy. Yeah, and that one's just a tragic story. As you heard him mention there that um, he called in sick this morning. He was to be notified today that he tested positive and unfortunately he passed away in his home this morning. Uh, the other big news out of that press conference and as we reported earlier in our newscast, the city council also voted on a new stay home work safe order. Um, that one will go or be in, it, in effect until May 19th. Right, extending it kind of a new order to more align with what the state's doing. Uh, although requiring face coverings for those 10 years or older, but no penalty if you don't wear face coverings. All right, let's check in right now with Adam Kasky with the weather situation and it is Thursday. It feels it like Thursday. Friday, but it's Thursday. And welcome to Thermometer Thursday. <laughs> thermometer, th oh, sorry, you wanted the thermometer in there. I I'm actually working on getting some Thermometer Thursday face masks. Wouldn't that be awesome? That would I be want one. Cool. Yeah, so yeah. we're working on that. Stay tuned. All right, so taking a look at our day today. It was an unseasonably cool start at 53. That's nine degrees below average, but this afternoon we made it up to 88, which is four degrees above average. Now the record high is 96, set back in 1953. 96. Oh, I think we're going to be there as we get into next week. Bright sunshine right now. Most of us in the upper 80s, 
There are a few exceptions. Canyon Lake at 82, even Castroville at 91, Divine 94. But 89 in Comfort, Bandera, you're 88, and Stinson right now at 87. Then you get into the 90s as you get closer to the Rio Grande. The typically warmer locations, Del Rio 95 and Carrizal Springs 93. All right, so let's talk about the temperatures tomorrow morning. Still unseasonably cool, but not like what we saw earlier today. Widespread mid to upper 50s is what we're thinking. About 54 in Fredericksburg, 56 here in San Antonio. 59 Catula, 55 in Pleasanton. So a lack of humidity will give us another, you know, un unseasonably cool start to the day. By the afternoon, bright sunshine, and we'll be pretty close to 90 degrees, even well into the 90s, closer to the border. All right, let's talk about dew points. They're still down. There's that lack of humidity in the air, but that all changes come Saturday. And we're going to have a stretch of muggy days here this weekend, all the way through the at least, I think, the middle part of next week, where you'll notice the thick humidity back in place. As for tomorrow, low humidity, 56 in the morning, 83 at noon, and then right near 90 with a lot of sunshine, just some high thin clouds and a southeasterly breeze at 10 to 20. Getting into the weekend. See those high temperatures back into the 90s, low morning clouds giving way to afternoon sunshine. And it looks like by Monday and Tuesday, we'll be well into the 90s. 96 on Monday and just shy of 100 on Tuesday. Get ready for it. Don't say it. No, <laughs> no, no. Yeah. Thank you, Adam. All right, Larry Ramirez is up next. And the latest from R.C. Buford and the Spurs organization after the break. It's been seven weeks since the Spurs last played a game. Their regular season was stopped in 19 contests ago because of the coronavirus. Today, Spurs Sports and Entertainment CEO R.C. Buford spoke with the media via Zoom. He said the NBA and the Spurs have every intention to return to play and to create the best environment they can for the league and fans. Buford was asked where the Spurs are right now, in town or out, and how are they monitoring them when it comes to health? We're having uh, systematically uh, timed calls with everybody or virtual meetings with everybody. Most of our group is in, in market. Uh, I think we've been really fortunate that, that uh, a big percentage of our group has been in market. Um, we've had virtual workouts. We've had virtual rehabilitation sessions. So guys who are fighting through injuries are doing virtual uh, rehabilitations. We've had coaching and video sessions. And, and so I think there's, uh, when we're not all together, I think they've done a good job of, of staying connected. RC jokingly said getting Coach Pop on a virtual call has been their biggest challenge. Pro football coverage, powered by Davis Law Firm. Wide receiver Brandon Cooks is entering his seventh NFL season and the Houston Texans his fourth NFL team. Some would view that as a negative, but not Cook saying it's a positive. He's wanted and he's still valued at a high level. He's played for the Patriots, the Saints, Rams, and now he's ready to catch passes from Deshaun Watson. During a video conference call, Cooks was asked how much pressure does it put on him to be the guy to come and replace wide receiver DeAndre Hopkins. First and foremost, um, I think, you know, just being brought in in general, as far as specifics, you know, of being brought in for a guy like DeAndre Hopkins or anything like that. I don't, um, I wouldn't necessarily say that. You talk about a great player that's uh, played a lot of uh, great football in his years as a Texan. You know, I just looking at it from a standpoint to just coming in uh, to help the team win as best as I can. Um, so that's the way that I look at it. It's official. Dallas Cowboys rookie wide receiver C.D. Lamb will wear number 88. Team owner Jerry Jones wanted C.D. to wear number 88 to honor Jerry's great friend and former Arkansas football teammate number 88, Jerry Lamb, who recently passed away. Jerry said over the weekend, if C.D.'s got the competes and the heart of that Jerry Lamb, he'll be bad to the bone. Speaking of, I love videos like these. Check out Holy Cross running back Romelo Portillo pulling a Toyota TRD, high knees and pumping those arms. He's also been pushing the same vehicle from behind. That's his dad's truck. Romelo is class of 2021. He's five foot eight, benches 300 pounds, and he squats 400 more. With schools and gyms shut down, he's still working hard and getting ready for his senior season with the Holy Cross Knights. I'll tell you, I love those type of videos. And any student athlete out there, high school, college, you have those, send them our way because we'll air them. You know who else loves them? His coach. His coach does, <laughs> <Yeah>. right? <laughs> his coach loves them, I'm Thank sure. You, Thank you, Larry. You got it. We'll be right back.
It's a segment we have called Coronavirus Q&A, where we try to take some of the facts and separate them from the fear that is out there. And every Thursday, we've been joined by Dr. Robert A. Frolickstein, an emergency room doctor here in town, and we are very pleased that he's back with us again. Uh, what are you seeing in the emergency rooms? Are you seeing the tide turn? Uh, yeah, you know, I, I, I've been very encouraged. Uh, last week, uh, over the last week, uh, we've had a few ca few new cases, um, but many more discharges. And in fact, right now, within the whole Methodist healthcare system, we have 15 patients or 14 or 15 patients with COVID that we're treating. And just to reassure everyone, those are all in a separate area of the hospital. They're all they're being cared for by separate care teams. So a nurse doesn't go from a COVID patient to a non-COVID patient. So it's definitely uh, safe to come into the hospital should you need to. Dr. Frolickstein, I want to ask you about the reopening of Texas. First of all, how are you at your hospital preparing for it? And how do you think it will impact operations there at the hospital? So, you know, I think we are prepared. Uh, we have processes in place. And, you know, obviously what we're concerned about is uh, if as the reopening progresses, we will see more cases. I think the big fear was early on and really the whole reason behind kind of closing things down was to prevent a huge surge that would overwhelm our capacity to care for patients with COVID and other illnesses. And I, I just, I think we're prepared now and I don't think we're gonna see that surge that we're unable to care for people. Do you think, are you still concerned that you're not seeing people that normally should be going to the emergency room? I'm not, and I'm not talking about COVID patients here. I'm talking about people with heart attacks and strokes and, and that kind of thing. Yeah, I am still, I am still certainly concerned. I think the last few days maybe have been a little bit better, but just as an example, Methodist uh, Hospital is a comprehensive stroke center. It means we have all the latest available treatments for strokes. One of those is a special medication that is very time sensitive. People need to get to the hospital quickly. We're going to use that medication. We normally use that medicine between 10 or 15 times in a month. In April, all of April, we only used it five times. And that, that means there's, you know, between five and 10 patients who missed out on an opportunity for a drug that might have helped them significantly. I so want to. I want to ask you about uh, visitation policies. You know, when uh, this pandemic came about, a lot of hospitals were implementing new policies in regards to the uh, visitation policies where people can't go in and visit their loved ones. Is, do you see that changing either there at your hospital or throughout the city? Um, I do. It's starting to, we're starting to relax it again. And it, uh, our, we're starting to relax it. And I know that I believe the elective surgery cases can have a visitor now. And I know they're looking at a plan to allow uh, at least a visitor per patient who's in the hospital. Uh, it's got to be carefully coordinated. We've got to make sure that those visitors are safe and that our, our staffs are safe. But I, I know that I think that's coming soon. Are, are face coverings mandatory when you come into the emergency room? I, I know that the governor kind of made it not mandatory uh, in his state order. Uh, city and county officials want it to be mandatory. Is it mandatory when you come into the emergency room? It, it is. Uh, every patient is placed uh, in a mask. And, of course, every uh, person who's working in the hospital also is uh, has a mask on. And not only that, they're all screened for symptoms and screened uh for fever before they enter the, the facility. And Dr. Frolickstein, just any final messages for our viewers to keep in mind as we uh, continue to progress along this pandemic? Uh, just, you know, I'm very hopeful that, uh, you know, there's such incredible work going on around vaccines. There's over 100 people working, our places working on vaccines and, and several of them are on, in phase one clinical trials. Uh, I still think we're a long way away, but it's just encouraging to see so many uh, really brilliant people working on uh, what we really need, which is an effective vaccine. Your definition of a long time, a year? At I least? think it's 12 to 18 months, I think. Uh, yeah. Dr. Robert A. Frolickstein will be joining us again on the 9 o'clock news tonight where he's going to take some viewer questions and uh, we can maybe go over some of the new symptoms uh, that, that were designated uh, momentary, moments ago, a few days ago. Dr. Frolickstein, sure. thank you for your time. My pleasure. Take care. We'll be right back.
Social distance, that may be the most commonly used two words in the world we live in right now. It's also the name of a new show coming to Netflix from the people who brought us Orange is the New Black. The people behind that hit show are working on an anthology series based on life during the pandemic. Social distance will tell deeply human stories that illustrate how we are living apart together. The series is being produced with the cast and crew all keeping their distance. No word on a release date. Well, today is the day we show some appreciation to a person a lot of people are missing right now, our hairstylist. April 30th is National Hairstylist Appreciation Day. Barber shops and hair salons are closed because of the coronavirus outbreak. It's going to be at least a couple more weeks before they are opened up here in Texas, perhaps. I, I certainly think the Appreciation Day is aptly timed because I'm feeling yes. it. those businesses <laughs> not part of the next phase of the reopening of the Texas economy that takes place tomorrow. Unless you're willing to try cutting your own hair or trusting someone else to do it, you're playing the waiting game as creating some interesting new looks for some of us who typically get a trim on a regular basis. So when you finally do get to see your favorite hairstylist or barber, a little extra tip might be in order to show them just how much you appreciate them. I think that's a perfect way to say thank you. Yeah. And I'm sure the work is going to be a lot harder too when you finally go in. They're going to have their work cut out. Yes, they will. Yeah. They're going to be very <laughs> yeah. busy. They're going to be very busy. Meanwhile, it's Thermometer Thursday and it looks like Adam might have taken a little off the top. <laughs> you think just a little bit? Yeah. Just a little off the feathers. <laughs> yeah. All right, we'll get to that later. It, I, I've got a lot of projects going on around here. All right. And it's quiet outside right now. Sunny, 88 degrees. Temperature down to 73 at 10 p.m. We'll be running a little, a little below average again later on tonight with widespread 50s tomorrow morning. We could use some rain. We'll look at the newest drought monitor. Talk about that. Rain chances when the heat and humidity returns coming up. All right, when Adam Kasky says he has some projects he's working on, <laughs> he's not kidding. No, it's like Hobby Lobby over there. Yeah, something. <laughs> yeah. It is, yeah. It, it, we'll, we'll get to this <laughs> in a moment. But I see what I need is these quiet weather days to where I can focus on some of these other projects a little bit more. So that's why I, I would love to see some rain around here, but it's not like we can control the weather, so I'll just take advantage of the situation in a different way. I've got feathers poofing up around me. We'll talk about it in a minute. All right. Taking a look at our precipitation so far for the month and the year. Well, April so far, I guess today's the last day. Uh, 2.89 inches and that's a little that's above average for this time of year. As for the the year, we're running nearly half an inch below average. We could use more rainfall and especially when you look at our drought monitor yeah, this indicates that as well. We still have some areas of extreme drought, southern Maverick County in particular, and then parts of the coastal bend here in the coastal plain. Now, the latest drought monitor, which came out today, is an improvement upon last week's by just a little bit east of San Antonio, and a big improvement upon a month to five weeks ago. But we want to do better. We still want to wipe all of this away. With the current weather pattern, unfortunately, we really just don't see a good chance of rain. Quiet satellite and radar picture, not even a cloud in the sky out there now, with the exception of some high thin clouds that are coming in from New Mexico and parts of the panhandle of Texas and West Texas. They'll be nicely streaming overhead later tonight and through the day tomorrow. Big bump in the upper level flow. That's the upper level ridge, the big blue H, and that's going to be in charge of our weather here for several days. Now, it's not going to be a huge and strong upper level high, but it's definitely going to have an impact on our temperatures and unfortunately keeping us dry. All the active weather that's along the East Coast right now and even farther north in parts of the Rockies. All right, looking at temperatures, 87 in Amarillo, Marfa at 86 degrees. Right now, 88 in San Antonio. We have some 90s out there, though, especially along the Rio Grande here, Del Rio at 95, even Laredo at 93 degrees. As we go through the evening, we'll see those temperatures fall off pretty quickly. And tomorrow morning, I think we'll be in the 50s again. But look at afternoon temperatures. 90 tomorrow. Eh, okay, whatever, right? This time of year, we're used to that. 
you get into next week and we just see those temperatures gradually climbing. So low to mid 90s this weekend and then we could be talking upper 90s, especially by Tuesday of next week. Right now we're forecasting 98 degrees, but look how a little cool front would put us back near average again by the middle part of next week. So this warming trend with higher heat and higher humidity, it's on the way here for several days. Dew points, they're down. You don't really feel the humidity out there today. It's dry and that dry air helps us cool off nicely at night. But look what happens here. Here's our future cast for that moisture coming off the Pacific. Tomorrow, we'll have a southeasterly wind. Notice 2 p.m. Winds coming off the Gulf of Mexico, but it's, it takes time for that humidity to really increase. So tomorrow you're not going to feel the mugginess, but here we go into Saturday. First thing in the morning, you'll notice the stickiness outside, and that's also going to give us the trend that we're used to of the low morning gray clouds leading to the afternoon sunshine. All right, 56 in the morning by noon, 83 by 5 p.m. 90 tomorrow. Bright sunshine, not too humid. Looking ahead into the weekend, there's the return of the humidity. Still a lot of sunshine. We just will have those typical low morning clouds. And that's going to be the case all the way through the middle part of the week until that next cool front comes. I wish I had better news in terms of rain chances. Unfortunately, eh, we're really grasping at straws here. Maybe just a 20% chance on Thursday, and that's about it. All right. <laughs> what are we doing over here <laughs> on, this, on this thermometer Thursday, right? What a are lot we, of feathers. What are we doing over here? Okay, so I, I have some turkey feathers, and these are from a wild turkey. We've got some wing feathers here. We've got some of the front fan covers that I'm sharing with you. And one thing people don't realize, that's why I'm going to tilt these. You get different angles of light off turkey feathers and you get some beautiful colors. You get some reds, especially sunlight, not so much artificial light, but you get some reds, you get some oranges, you get some blues, depending on the angle and the type of feather that you're actually looking at. So why do I have these here? Well, I want to incorporate them into a thermometer. That's what I want to do, and I'm still kind of brainstorming this, and my son and I were kind of coming up with an idea. Uh, we had a very successful turkey hunt uh, recently, and that bird's going to feed us nicely this weekend, and I don't want these lovely, beautiful feathers to go to waste either, and it, I think it'll make it for a really nice, unique way to feature this lovely bird, and if, so that's what I have. If you can pull that off, I, that'll be impressive. Yeah, that's the thing. But you are Mr. Crafty. So Luckily, have we have a lot of them. You know, right? if not a thermometer, but maybe you can make some sort of Elton John outfit. <laughs> I'll leave all those glasses to go with it. Yeah, right? that's what I'm yeah, just, big glasses know. and yeah, that's what I'm uh, yeah. Hat, but yeah. I, I have an idea. So picture a kind of rectangular block, uh, kind of thick. I'll, I could drill some, with a thermometer on it, drill some narrow holes in it, and then mount the feathers inside those holes to, and make like a pattern, kind of like a bouquet of flowers, a bouquet of feathers. I, yeah, that'd be good. You know, connected to the thermometer. I, I still Keep kind of like K -K -K Kaski and the Jets. <laughs> I think maybe, you keep know. Keep us posted, Adam. Hey, That's gonna be I will yeah. keep you posted. All this right. is going to take some creativity here. In case you missed it, coming up next. Here's today's In Case You Missed It. He was tested for COVID-19 Tuesday by this morning. Detention officer Timothy De La Fuente had died. Bear County Sheriff's officials confirming the agency's first coronavirus related death. De La Fuente was a 27 year veteran of the sheriff's office and had actually survived being attacked on the job inside the jail a few years ago. De La Fuente was also assigned to a so-called jail hotspot, an area of the jail that has had a lot of COVID-19 positive results in recent weeks. Sheriff Salazar saying this will be considered a line of duty death. De La Fuente will be buried with full Bear County Sheriff's Off honors. HEB adding meat to the list of purchase limits due to the COVID-19 impact on meat packing plants. Those limits apply to various stores throughout Texas and right here in San Antonio. Ground beef limited to one package. 
beef, chicken, pork, and turkey limited to two packages of any combination. Police have released pictures of a suspect. This is the person officers are looking for right now. Police say someone started a fire at the leasing office inside an apartment complex in the 4800 block of Gus Eckert Road. That's on the northwest side. They tell us they believe this person set some kind of fluid on fire in front of the office's double doors and then took off. Well, students are out of classrooms, but a San Antonio school is staying connected through music. A week ago, the varsity group from Fox Tech ALA cast posted a video on YouTube of a virtual concert. It's a very difficult song, and we were very proud of the students to be able to do that. A special helicopter meant to fly on Mars finally has a name thanks to an Alabama high school student. NASA has named its Mars helicopter Ingenuity. But Niza Rupani suggested the name during the space agency's Name the Rover essay contest. In her submission, she wrote Ingenuity is what allows people to accomplish amazing things and it allows us to expand our horizons to the edges of the universe. NASA's Ingenuity will ride on Mars attached to the Perseverance rover when it launches this summer and will be the first aircraft to attempt powered flight on another planet. Interesting. Very neat. It's almost like a Mars drone. Yeah. Yeah. See you on the Night Beat tonight at 9 and, of course, online at 9.